Hello, good morning. Welcome to East to West Weight Loss Surgery, the podcast. I'm April and I'm the West. And I'm Jason and I'm the East. We support the bariatric community with humor, humility, and honesty. If you guys are brand new to listening or watching us, welcome. We're so excited that, that we have found each other. Uh, Jason and I both underwent a, a bariatric procedure called VSG for short, or vertical sleeve gastrectomy. I've lost over 120 pounds. Jason has lost over 150 pounds. Uh, we had a great surgical experience, but Jason and I realized that the support that we received after our procedure uh, was not the best. We were really struggling uh, just emotionally. We were missing some connections and we were realizing we didn't have all the tools in our toolbox that we needed to find success after bariatric surgery. Uh, so Jason and I met randomly at a virtual bariatric meetup that I hosted. Uh, and he and I became very close friends just based on the conversations that we had about our own experience. So he and I teamed up to create East to West uh, Weight Loss Surgery. So we are so excited uh, to be able to provide this the support to the, the community because it, it helps us. And if it helps us, then we think it's going to help you. Yes, definitely. So today we are thrilled to be welcoming a bariatric therapist. Her name is Wendy Rawlings. Hi, Wendy. Hello. <laughs> Wendy and I met, I think about two years ago. Um, I was seeing a therapist for food addiction before my bariatric procedure. And uh, my therapist at the time said, you know what? I really want to recommend Wendy to you. She specializes in, in bariatric therapy. She's amazing. I think she'll be a wonderful resource for you. So I have been seeing Wendy for two years now. And the only reason I think I have truly been successful is because I've had Wendy in my corner every single step of the way. You are kind. <laughs> And she continues to be in my corner, and now she is in the East to West WLS corner. So, Wendy, thank you so much for joining us today. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Will you introduce yourselves to our listeners and to our followers? Let, let, let them know who you are. All right. Well, I'm happy to be here. I am a fellow bariatric person, journeyer. Uh, I had a ruin Y in August of 2005 and lost 205 pounds. Um, and here it is. It's still, still mostly off. I, I bounced 10 pounds, which made me feel better. I was a little bit under, I think. Um, and as April, Jason and I were talking, we realized that together we've lost 483 pounds. And I think, <laughs> I think we're amazing. And I think if you're here to get answers to how to do this and keep it off, you're in the right place. So yeah, so and I, um, I have a practice in Washington. And right now it's super much online because that's where everybody hangs out. Um, and I'm just just happy to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Yep. Wendy is a phenomenal resource for this community. She is a, a nationally certified distance counselor. So if you are looking for someone to help you in your bariatric journey, we cannot recommend uh, Wendy more. All of her information will be linked on our website. It will be linked on our Instagram page. It's just going to be absolutely everywhere. We highly recommend that, that you reach out to her if, if you are looking for support because she is, she's an expert. And why I think I connect so well with you, Wendy, is that I mean, not only are you a skilled therapist, you, you are a skilled healer, but you have lived through what I'm living through. So it's so nice to be able to talk to you on both of those levels, because I think sometimes when you and I talk, it's very much about the, you know, the, the inner workings of our brains and, and who I am as a person. And then some things are just strictly coming up because I've had bariatric surgery. So it's nice to be able to go, okay, no, this is an issue that, that's true or indeed to you. And then, oh, well, this is an issue that's coming up because you've had surgery. And sometimes they, they mix and they intertwine and sometimes they're two separate things. So it's just so nice to be able to say, okay, here's what I'm experiencing. Here's what I'm going through. Here's what I'm thinking. And then to be able to dive into that and really get to the root of it, you know, from both lenses is such a powerful piece that I think so many people don't even think about or don't realize, but you really you don't need even know to think about, right? Yes. Yeah. Just incredible. Just, just in, yeah. Uh, phenomenal. So we um, are very interested in the topic that we are going to be talking about today. Jason and I talk about this often. We know that it comes up often in the community. And I think people, again, if you don't know what the word is, you don't know what it is until you hear it. Today's topic is all about addiction transfer. And this is, I think, the biggest issue in the weight loss surgery community. We know that you have a 50% chance of regaining your weight up to two years after surgery. 
And we regain our weight because we transfer that addiction or that dependence on food to other aspects or other things in life. And that either causes us to regain weight or it causes us to, to participate in activities that bring up the shame cycle. And then that throws us back into food. And then that throws us back into, you know, living our lives at our old weight after, after our procedure. So, um, you know, I think a lot of people in this community are really afraid to say the word addiction. They don't want to admit that they have a food addiction, or maybe they truly don't have an addiction, but they have a dependence or they have a very high tolerance. Mm -hmm. So I'm very much looking forward to diving into what addiction transfer is, what addiction is, what the difference between addiction, tolerance, and dependence is, and then to come up with some solutions to talk about how we can fight back when, when these old habits, these old poles, these old addictions, these old dependences pop up after surgery. It's, it's going to be, I think, one of the most meaningful conversations that Jason and I have ever had. And, um, and we're very excited to, to share this conversation with the community. Excellent. So let's just start out with some definitions then, all right? Um, Perfect. So I, and I remember the first time, this was, was far after I had surgery, probably five to seven years after my own surgery, where I realized I was addicted to sugar. And it never occurred to me that I was addicted to anything. I, I was, I, I don't drink, I don't drug, I don't, you know, I'm not compulsive. Uh, and when I realized I was addicted to sugar, I just, I remember sitting down and going, huh, I, you can addict to sugar. And so I want to tell you kind of that the, the progression of addiction so that it makes sense to you. So the first step, there's three steps, three progressions. The first one is tolerance. And tolerance happens when you don't respond to the, the, the drug, in this case, food, the way that you used to. So when you had that first thing that you just loved um, and it was unexpectedly wonderful, um, your brain, our, our dopamine circuits in our brain just, just squirted out a huge rush of dopamine. And if you, re, if you remember eating something that you didn't realize you were going to love so much the first time you ate it, that was a dopamine surge. And that becomes really, really reinforcing. And we want to get that surge again. So then we eat that thing again, even if it's something we shouldn't eat because it felt so good. And that's the beginning of an addiction. So the first step is the tolerance where the surge is not as great as it was the first time or the second time or the 10th time. And so we want more of it or we want to do it more often to get that same surge or that same effect. And so um, it's, it's our, our food high, if you want to call it that. Yeah. So when that doesn't do anything for us, then we move to the second level, which is dependence. And that means we go through withdrawal when we don't have that type of food. We get symptoms. And I know when I was going off of sugar, I had a headache like I could not believe for, for three days. It was my three-day headache that felt like I wanted to die. <laughs> and that really was a wake-up call to me that, wow, you really, this is physical. This isn't emotional anymore. This is something that is in your body. It's really physical. And so um, so you, you actually go off, when you go off of it, there's with, withdrawal symptoms. And then you know that you're dependent, your body has actually needed that substance or that food to, to, be, to be normal, to, to feel good, to feel normal. And then um, the last part is addiction. And this is where it, you just have such a difficult time stopping with tolerance and, and dependence. You can take it or leave it most of the time, but with addiction, it's it's really, really, really hard to even let it alone. And it occupies your thoughts. It, it sort of takes over your life and that you know that you're, you're addicted. So um, you can have a high tolerance, you can have um, withdrawal symptoms, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're addicted. Addiction is, is where you just literally need to have it to function normally or feel and, normal. As you well, know. And the hardest thing about that coming from, and, and you touched on it actually in the beginning, talking about a lot of people don't, A, don't know that that's what it is because that's just not something that they equate to food like we've talked about in the past, April and I. And, and you know, that's just, they, they don't know how to handle it because they've never come up against it. It's something they didn't even know they were facing. So 
I think this is going to be extremely helpful to help people build the tools that they need, you know, the, the toolbox they need to be able to combat this and anything we can do to make, you know, everybody's journey a little easier. Uh, I think this is really going to be helpful for that as one of the reasons I'm so excited for this episode today. So that makes a, that makes a lot of sense right off the bat. We're diving in. And I think that's going to be, that's going to be amazing just to tell what the rest of the episode is going to be like. Thanks. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. All right. Are you guys ready? <laughs> yes, oh, what's your question? All right, let's do it. So when you were talking, uh, a couple of things popped up into my brain and, and I think I can really relate to them. Uh, w w the, the first, when I really realized that my tolerance to food was increasing was that when I would think about something I was going to eat and then I would eat it and I would be disappointed that it wasn't as good as what I thought it would be. But I kept thinking back to, oh man, but I remember when I ate this before and it was so good either something I made at home or a meal that I had had at a restaurant. And then to know that in, you know, when I was eating that in the moment, it didn't quite compare to, to what I remembered. And I, rem and I remembered that that was odd to me. And it was like, why am I like even thinking about this? So when you said that, I was like, oh, okay. That's and then when you were talking about how, you know, you, 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 your behavior changes when you don't take in a certain type of food it's like oh my god I would get hangry all the time I mean I and I know Jason and I talk about this often if we didn't have certain foods or if we got to a point in our hunger that we were just like we felt emaciated our personalities changed I yeah. mean we were just like angry humans because we weren't eating and you're going this is so stupid like you don't need to eat really it's just this is now impacting like your personality or like who you are as a human and then to go that one step further to, to think, well, I can't survive without it. Just to hear you go through that progression was like, oh, okay. And I have said publicly that I, I was addicted to food. I am addicted to food before in the past. And I just feel like every single time that we talk, I learn, I, I just become more and more solidified in that statement, which is not easy for me to say. Nobody wants to admit like I, am, I was, I am dependent on food. That sounds crazy because we need food to survive. But I think the reason, one of the many reasons that this conversation is so important is because even if we're not addicted to food, if we are in this spectrum, right, between tolerance, dependence, and addiction, we are using food in a way that's not healthy for us. So what we're gonna talk about today and, and what we're sharing it and the tools that we're gonna share, it's not just for somebody who is a straight up food addict, addict, right? It's for anybody who is dependent on food or is has an increased tolerance to food because this spectrum really wants to work towards the addiction side of things. And we have to stop at where we're at and work to to not make, to make sure it doesn't progress. And then we have to work to, to get it, you know, going Roll it in, back in the yeah. other direction. Yes, exactly. Holy crap. Okay. So it's, it's important to understand those three steps. And it's also important to realize that, that by that, by now, if you are resonating with any of this, that your, your dopamine pathway, your addiction pathway in your brain is up and running when it comes to food. And it's not food in general, it's specific foods that do it for you. So you're not addicted to food as much as you're addicted to whatever that, that danger food is or that gateway food is for you. And so it's important to realize that, you know, the, when I had my surgery, I decided in order for me to just maintain an anchor and, and ground myself, I was going to abstain from one food the rest of my life. And I looked at what I was doing and I, my biggest gateway food was ice cream. And so if I had ice cream then I would, I would have other stuff too that I shouldn't have because my dopamine pathway got so triggered by that, activated by that. And back then I didn't know that's what was going on, but now I do in retrospect. So I chose to uh, go off of ice cream. I haven't had ice cream since. And in the beginning, it was it was hard. And I, especially if other people were eating ice cream. Now I serve ice cream, you know, at, at functions, at parties, and, and I'm not even tempted to lick the spoon. It's just that easy. But the last, the, my last ice cream party I had with my friends and family was at Cold Stone. And I can't imagine a better memory than that last ice cream party. And so I, when I look at ice cream and in the beginnings, especially when I was going off of it, I looked at it and I thought, there's nothing 
that will ever compare to that memory. I'm going to let that memory be my dopamine pathway. And when I think about ice cream, I think about that memory and I get high, you know, high emotionally. I get happy and think, yeah, that was the best time. That was just the best time. And so, um, so that's one way, by the way, to, to, to deal with an addiction is to, to decide to abstain from something, make the last consumption of that amazing, and then just go back and remember the memory because nothing will ever compare to that. It's like eating that food that you didn't think was that great the fir for the first time, getting that dopamine shot, and nothing's going to ever compare to that again because it's that first dopamine shot. And that's where the, the addiction starts. Well, and that's one of the things April and I have actually talked about too, is, is how you get to that point where you just, you, you know, your, your brain capacity frees up the ability for you to think of things that aren't so food related mm -hmm. and just, you know, engrossed in food itself. And, you know, post-op, you, your brain literally frees up so much capacity for you to be able to do those things. So, you know, where a lot of us are really dreading going into the holidays because we think we're going to be so obsessed on a certain food or something that we're, you know, not supposed to eat, but we're going to really want to. I think a lot of people are going to be pleasantly surprised that a lot of those fears aren't going to be as impactful as maybe they thought they would be because their brain capacity is going to allow them to be more concentrated on spending time with family or people that they haven't seen in a long time or doing things other than being so worried about, you know, so food obsessed. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I'm actually looking forward to this year is that I'm going to be less worried about all of that. So I can either focus on putting more love into the food that I'm making for the people that are going to eat it that, you know, aren't myself or, you know, just worrying about the, you know, getting together with those people and doing the things that I want to do versus being so worried about what time we're going to eat, how much stuff I'm going to get and who's worried about my plate and how it looks. And do I need to get two plates instead of one, because it's going to look crazy if I get one giant mountain plate, you know, there's so many things that rapid fire off in your brain when you're thinking about these get togethers that I just am really looking forward to not having to deal with this year. And I hope that a lot of other people are going to find it to be the same. That's great. That is great. Yeah, no, that's, that's all good. And I'm finding that I, I, as soon as I decided to eat differently pre-surgery, so I got used to it, yeah. that um, I started focusing more on people, other people and relationships mm -hmm. and also in what I was thankful for and, you know, better health and all kinds of, when, when I refocused my thoughts, outside of food and onto people and things I really was happy about and grateful for everything changed it made it so easy well not completely easy but we we get traditions around food especially at holidays so it wasn't a walk in the park but it was so much easier and I didn't feel deprived and that was the main thing I didn't want to feel deprived right. so yeah and I think you know what yeah what what's so powerful about the process that we go through is that depending on how far we out we are out from surgery we're going to have a different experience i mean i remember i was so turned off by food i absolutely i didn't want to eat food ever again you know when i was like three four five months post-op it was like food is stupid i can live off protein shakes i don't need it i don't want it i was so done with it but yeah. now that i'm 16 months out you know my cravings are coming back and you know my stomach is healed and i kind of have old school hunger again so it's nice to know that you know where you are in the process can really you can use that as a tool every step of the way mm -hmm. but when you do get to the point where food starts to become more appealing to you right or it you're just feeling like you're always battling this it's so nice to know that okay i have a little bit more of my brain back that i can use to say okay wait a minute why am i so panicked freaking out why am i so upset over not being able to eat or right my desire to 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 consume these items and just to know that you're normal that what you're experiencing is what most people who go through bariatric surgery are experiencing is comforting and then to know that there are tools and resources and people and things out there that you can use to battle it when it does come up is is powerful because i think jason and i've said this for for many of us nothing is off the food table when we recover from bariatric surgery, right? Some of us need to or, or choose to abstain from certain foods. And that's a decision that, that you need to make. Right. But to know that, you know, when you're healed, you know, 
it could just be sky's the limit. And if you don't make these changes, if you don't have these conversations, if you don't build these lasting habits, you're going to weigh what you weighed after surgery, you know, before surgery, your, your weight's never going to change. You're going to go through this whole huge process and you're going to be right back where you started. And we don't want that to happen to you. We, we want you to be on the losing side of, of bariatric surgery, right? On that stat. We don't want you to be on the, on the gaining side okay. of that stat. Yeah. And like what you said, Wendy, this work is difficult. It's not easy, but it's the work that we have to do to find success after bariatric surgery. That's right. And so just along those lines and talking and applying it to addiction, um, the, the skills that we had before we went into surgery cannot be the same skills we have after surgery or we will end up in the same place. So it's learning and it's doing differently. And um, so I wanna talk about a little bit about addiction transfer or cross addiction. Um, it's people say, oh, I have an addictive personality or this and that about addiction. And, and really what it is, is that we have learned to deal with our life using something besides our feelings and our brain together. And addiction to whatever it is, is just a symptom of the problem. And it's, it's the way that we deal with whatever that basic problem is. So the reason we cross addict is because we have not dealt with the problem. So we still use those, those first half a life skills before surgery skills to deal with whatever the problem is. And so we just, we continue to, to um, act, keep those dopamine pathways going and act compulsively by, because we, we can't use food anymore, choose not to use food anymore. We might use gambling, we might use spending, we might use sex, we might use drugs. We, there's all kinds of ways that we can transfer the addiction to some other thing or substance. And so what we wanna do is talk about what do we do so we don't do that. So once and for all, we are done with tolerance, dependence and addiction. And I'm using the word addiction, um, but it could mean it could be tolerance and it could be dependence. I'm just going to use addiction, but know that that's not necessarily what it is. So, so the the thing that that keeps the addiction in place is the fact that we have not dealt with the the driver of it. Mm -hmm. um, it could be anything. It could be a trauma. It could be feelings that we've never resolved. It could be feelings we don't want to acknowledge. It could be something that happened to you when you were two, or something that happened to you yesterday. But the point is we've developed a pattern of handling hard things using something besides just getting in touch with ourselves. And I wanna to speak to this. You and I have done a lot of work on this. And I think Jason, you and I have talked about this a lot as well. I, I have a hardcore addiction to food. I use food to deal with emotions that, that I was experiencing. I really have not experienced like uh, an event that I think most people would call traumatic, right? I mean, I've, I've never, you know, I, I hear what people have lived through and it's uh, astronomical. And, and I, I've had some moments of trauma, which I recognize, but my, you know, my trauma is different than I think a lot of people's trauma. But just because mine is different in caliber doesn't mean that it was not traumatic to me. So I think it's very important that we recognize that your experience is your experience and you cannot and you should not compare it to, to other people's. Because I think, you know, my food addiction is rooted in, I grew up in a family where, you know, you just didn't really express emotion that much or like kind of like big or scary things happened and you just, you, you dealt with it. You, you put on your, your, your big girl pants or, you know, you put on your big boy pants and you dealt with it. You took care of it. And there was no room for, um, you know, for this overtly, you know, expression of emotion. And we just didn't talk about things. And so for me, that was, I dealt with these emotions, with these feelings by eating. I was stressed. I was anxious. I was disappointed. I was sad. I was mad. I was overwhelmed, right? All of these experiences that I was going through instead of just sitting back and going, oh my God, I'm really pissed off. And then talking through, well, why am I mad? Why am I feeling this way, right? All of these conversations that now I know I need to have with myself, I just turned to food. And, and I ate my way numb. And then I got a little break from my feelings. And then I was able to shove them back down and carry on. And everything was, everything was great. That's exactly so, right. Yeah. Okay. And I know, Jason, you kind of talked about this too. I think you use food as, uh, you know, your, your personality. You wanted to portray this over-the-top personality. And 
you could be over the top in a lot of different ways. And you also figured out, well, I could be over the top in food, right? Like that one pound or 10 pound hamburger story. You know, it's just, we all, we all use it a different way. Well, yeah. And it's the, it's the same way kind of I did with as the weight piled on to myself, the more boisterous and outgoing and center of attention I became and the more fun I poked at myself, because as long as I'm the one bringing attention to my weight and my size and how I look and all that, that disarms everybody else from being able to do that. As long as I'm the one throwing it out there, now you don't have anything to come at me about, which I never, I, I never experienced that around my social circle or my personal self, but just it kind of made me feel at ease with the way I looked and the way I felt about myself by being the one to bring it out and bring attention to it because you know not only was I the loudest or the most talkative one in the room I was the biggest one in the room and I you know and that was just kind of the way I approached everything including menus and restaurants and outings everybody knew I was going to go to order the biggest whatever the most ridiculous thing on the menu was I was going to try it you know Mm -hmm. I was always Yeah, but but it was so funny because I would limit myself because in certain circumstances, because I knew better. Like I wasn't going to go to someplace and try to eat a 72 ounce steak because I knew I was not going to be able to do that. I didn't have the stomach capacity to do it. But if they had a 10, a 12 or a 16 ounce ribeye, I'm not getting the 12 because that's not near enough. I'm going to do the 16 and I'm going to do double mashed potatoes with it because, they, you know, that's what I want to eat. And every dip, you know, every bite of steak had a dip of mashed potatoes in it. You know, it just, I did things in that, you know, grandiose of an order just because, you know, I, I always had that fear of, well, I'm not going to go out and pay money to not be full. And I would rather take a little bit home, but I'm probably not going to have to because I can eat all that. <laughs> So, so I love, I love what I'm hearing from both of you, because these are stories that we tell ourselves to get through it. And that's a different, a different podcast day, but (laughs) it's, it's what we, it's what we tell ourselves and it becomes our identity and it becomes who we are and it feeds into the addiction. Um, In our community, in the bariatric community, we, we have basically two parts to us. We have the head from the neck up and then we have the body from the the neck down and the two don't communicate very well ever unless unless something is really hurting in the body and then the body will let the the head know and the head really doesn't want to know most of what the body's going you know most of us don't like our bodies or we didn't you know before surgery we just it was a thing that carried our head around it had a use and that was the use and that's where the addiction gets going because the stuff that drives the addiction lives mostly in the body there's a few compulsions that our head hangs out with but mostly it's living it's it's what lives in the body um and we we service those those feelings those cravings those drives just to get it off our back those drives off our back and i've got i've had so many clients say you know i think about food all week and i say no and i say no and i say no and i finally do it just to just to quit thinking about it because the body is driving it, or there's a compulsive thought in our mind, or the dopamine pathway is triggered. And once I do the food, then I feel so much better. And so that becomes reinforcing that, yeah, you made the right decision, go eat that thing. And, um, and so that's kind of, kind of what we want to work on, because that's the solution to what's really going on. You, you both gave great, I, a great uh, backstories to, to why food was important for you. And so the question I would ask is what, why is food important for you? What, to, to those that are listening, what influence, what role does food play in your life before surgery? Does it play a different role after surgery long-term? And if it doesn't, then you're probably going to go back to those first pre-surgery skills that didn't serve you well. So we need to, to develop the post-surgery skills. So the best thing, the best way to do it is to do that thing that's hard. It's like April said, we did talk earlier. The solution isn't easy, um, but nothing worth doing usually is. So the solution is to figure out what the cause is, what's actually driving the behavior, which means we have to get our head and our body talking to each other. And that means the body or the, the head has to go down and do a field trip into the body every day, um, preferably two or three times a day to find out what's really going on with your feelings. 
because once you know what you're feeling, you don't need to eat to hold those feelings down from yourself. You're just trying to keep from feeling them or keep them a secret for yourself. And so there's some techniques and some ways that we can do that. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And one of the things I keep thinking about when you're talking about that is, you know, it's not easy in, in, in our in our setup for being bariatric patients, it's not easy, but it's necessary. Like it's, that's just, it's that. I mean, it, it's yeah. not like, it's not easy, but you know, we're going to give it a try. Like, no, it's not easy, but it's necessary. Like if yes. you're going to succeed in this journey, you can't just, eh, let, let's try and see if this will work. Like it's got it. Like you, it's, a, it's a necessity that these things, that we make these things happen. And kind of one of the things that April and I had talked about when you're talking about the head and the body talking to each other is, you know, I went through a couple of weeks ago where I, I wasn't hungry at all, but my brain was like, hey, yeah, but it's lunchtime. What's up? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, but, but I'm not like, I'm good. And then it's, it's like, yeah, but it's, but it's new. What, what if you don't get to eat again? Like, like, what if you don't have the time? What if it's all the way till dinner before you get to eat again? Like, like, what, don't you want a little something? Like, and I'm like, no, no. I'm like, I'm good. Like, I'm literally having the fight, you know, the good angel and the bad angel on my shoulder. And I'm like, like, for no, for real, I'm good. Like, I don't need and, and I and I was able to get past it. But it just, that was something that I, I couldn't wait to talk to April about. Because I was like, I know I'm not the only one that goes through the times a day, whereas it's like, Oh, it's breakfast time. You should probably grab something. And I'm like, no, I just had a protein shake. Like I'm good. And be like, yeah, but probably just a little something. And I'm like, no. That's exactly right. Yeah, we get in those patterns, don't we? Yes. And it, it always amazes me. I mean, one one of the biggest aha moments I've had with you, Wendy, is that my brain and my body are actually connected, right? I actually had to acknowledge that I did have a body. And I remember the first time that, that Wendy told me this, I was like, uh-huh, you're hilarious. Like, yeah. <laughs> Right. This, my body, yeah, has a say? No. Yeah. And it's because so much of my life, and I think, you know, our lives is, is done in the head and, and the head is the, the boss and it, and it tells the body what to do. But this is not, if this isn't talking to your body, you're, you're not actually ever giving your body what it needs. So all of a sudden you, you've got like, you know, two separate nations here that are sailing in a different direction at all times. And it causes this friction and it causes this misunderstanding. And if we don't do this work, it's, it's never going to work. It's, they're never going to line up. And the only way that you can live at a healthy weight is if they do line up. And if you do just say, okay, I'm, I'm not using food uh, in the best possible way, right? That I, I'm using food or I'm you know, using a substance to help me get through. And I can't keep, I just can't keep doing that. And it's hard to admit. And, um, you, you know, I realized that I was transferring my addiction, I think when I was about six months out, and I know Wendy, you and I've talked about this, and Jason, you and I've talked about this as well. Um, I, I, I enjoy drinking alcoholic beverages, I don't do it often. Uh, and I was just really at a bad place after recovery. And I was at the grocery store and a local brewery had a new tropical flavored beer. I mean, it sounds gross, but it wasn't great, whatever. And I bought it and I, and I had it at home with me and I sat down on the couch and I cracked a beer and my husband got home and he's like, Oh, what are you drinking? And I was like, Oh, it's the new beer from, I don't know what brew it was. And he's like, Oh, well, that's weird. And I was like, what's weird, you know, kind of getting defensive. And he's like, well, you never drink in the day, especially. And he's like, and you don't like beer. And I was like, oh, whatever, you know, and I just kind of did this, you don't know me and oh, hell no, you know, and just blah, 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 blah. And, you know, my poor husband was just like, I just saying it was weird. You know, like that's all he said. It wasn't judgmental. It wasn't anything like that. And I sat back in the couch and, you know, he left because I, you know, destroyed his, you know, everything nice about him. And then I just thought, okay, yeah, he's, he's right, right? Like I am transferring my need or my desire to not deal with my emotions and I'm moving it over to, to another area. And if I would have continued down that path, my weight would have skyrocketed back up again. And now I would have had a problem with addiction and my weight would have been up again. So lovely, lovely, <laughs> lovely scenarios. Perfect. Right. It's great insight. And, and so, you know, you'll have, we'll have people listening who are saying, I don't want to talk to my body. I don't like my body. My body has nothing to tell me. And, and there'll be people whose bodies are going, yes, yes, yes. Finally, somebody gets it. Please talk to me. 
And we'll be having people going, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. I'm entitled to do what I want to do. And um, we're, we're all in all spectrums. And I think the three of us can agree that we've all felt this way. Yeah. And sometimes we still do. And so all this is normal. And the, the best thing to do at this point, especially if you're feeling some resistance, like with the beer, I love that story. Uh, you're feeling some resistance, <laughs> maybe a little on April's part uh, with the beer. Mm-hmm. You, you just want to step back and get curious and non-judgmental. That's the very first thing you want to train yourself to do is just step back and go, huh, well, that's weird. I, I didn't expect I would be feeling that way or wonder why I feel that way. And don't be, don't be judgeful, judgy and say, I shouldn't feel that way. Never say that because your feelings are your feelings, but just step back and go, huh, that's interesting. I wonder why I reacted that way. Yep. And that's the beginning of, of fixing this. And, and that's hard to do because for so long, I, I mean, myself, I never stopped and got curious about anything I was doing, right? I was so consumed. My brain was so consumed with food or with finding food, planning food, you know, trying to deal with my emotions, trying to deal with my professional life, my personal life. There was never a moment that I could take or that I felt like I could take to go, why am I doing this? And now that I'm, you know, recovering from bariatric surgery, the thing that I tell everybody when they ask me, what's the biggest change? I always say, I can't believe how much more time I have to do things or think about things because 90% of my brain now is not dedicated to food. I've got like 10% or 5% that's thinking about food. So to, to know that we need to take a pause, we need to really look at what is going on in our lives and the actions that we're taking or the anxiety that we feel about food, right? I think the, the, the simple way to know or, or to start discovering, okay, am I addicted to food or do I have a dependence or a tolerance is, you know, every time that you eat something is to know that you can take a moment and go, okay, am I really hungry? Or what am I feeling about, about this, this meal? Or is, does something feel off? It's just asking ourselves these, these really simple questions and then giving ourselves a moment to answer them yeah. truthfully. Yeah. And a lot of times it really isn't even about food. We, we spend a lot of time there and thinking about food, but it might be, I'm really anxious or I'm really depressed or really worried about my children, or I'm really worried about my job. And we, we use food to cover up the worry. So then we spend a lot of time thinking about our food so that we don't have to think about what, whatever it is we're worried about. So I think, you know, and so that's, so this is the next step. So we want to step back and get curious when you can. But we want to prevent as much of this initially in the first place as we can. So the prevention is actually taking time mindfully every day on purpose to sit and think about what you're feeling. Um, So think about what you're feeling and let your mind and your body have a connection. And um, I that that process is called mindfulness. And I don't even want to get into the, the definition of mindfulness because Mindfulness definitions are going to vary with whoever you talk to. So the way I'm using it in this conversation is just taking a break from the treadmill that you're living on and just connecting these two places in us on purpose and, um, and just, you know, taking five to 20 minutes a day in the morning and the same amount or a different amount in the evening. So you're checking in at least twice a day. If you can check in midday, that would be fabulous. That would really help. But you're just on purpose checking in and you're letting your mind feel whatever it is you're feeling. Your body is way, way, way anxious at any moment to tell you what it's feeling. Most of the time, again, we've got this two nation separation. I like that uh, analogy. And uh, and it doesn't want to know. It just doesn't want to know or it doesn't have time. It doesn't feel like it has time. So, so it's actually purposefully connecting. And And there's a couple of exercises I'm gonna refer you to that show you how to do this. And a couple of uh, apps that you can, that are free that you can put on your phone that will help you do this, makes it super easy. But that's really the the solution because then if you have some unfinished business, you have some trauma or you have some beliefs that aren't working for you or, or whatever, you can locate them by following your feelings to where that is. Um, do you guys want to say anything about that before I talk about how to do that? I think I, I would just like to say what, what has been very helpful for me is that I don't have the capacity every day to have these meaningful conversations with myself. Right. But I know that I have to, because 
I know that I'm, I'm still in the danger zone. So if I get to a point in my day and I'm like, oh my God, I'm just, uh, I really want something. And I know that I have already eaten, right? I know that my nutrition is, is, is okay. Mm -hmm. I will literally, I just, I reach for my water bottle, right? And I take a sip of water and then I give myself 10 seconds to feel the water move through my system and hit my stomach. And if that water hits and my body goes, you're full, that's my key to go, I am not hungry. I am stressed, I'm upset, I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm emotional, something is wrong and it has nothing to do with my physical hunger. It's a great tool that I've used because I need to hydrate anyways. I'm not doing myself any harm by taking a sip of water. But if I consume that sip and my body tells me, oh, no, you, you really do need some nutrition, then I can go to my, okay, triage. And I've got my list, protein, 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 protein. <laughs> oh, it's easy to remember. Yeah. And I always have those items in my home ready to go so that, okay, it's okay that I have to eat. I should eat. I'm human. I need to take in nutrition to, to survive. But my go-to is no longer a bag of Cheetos or a breakfast sandwich or whatever other delicious food used to be in my house. My go-to now is cheese or a, a type of meat-based protein, a type of plant-based protein, right? Uh, a protein bar, a protein shake, all of these things that are nutritious for me and fit within my macros. To me, that's really helping me overcome this, this addiction to food, right? Because I need to be dependent on food. I have to survive, mm -hmm. but I, I need to make the, the healthy choices uh, consistently. And it's not that I eat perfectly uh, every day. It's not, right? I just don't. And I'm not going to say that I do, but I do that consistently. That's what has helped me uh, be able to release 120 pounds and to maintain that weight loss for 16 months. I'm so close to the two year mark, right? If I can stay focused on that two year mark, then I know that I've hit a milestone and the, and the, the work will continue to, to just become, you know, habit in my life. But, you know, there are things that we can do, little things that will help us in these moments of panic. And they, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be this big, huge thing. It can be this little thing that we chunk at, we, we, we you know, we, we hit away at every single day. And every day we do that. It's like James Clear says, we're 1% better. If we can get 1% better every day, we're going to be the most amazing human that we knew we always could be in not a lot of time. And it's going to be a process that we actually enjoy instead of dread. That's right. So I'm going to unpack what you just said uh, in a couple of ways. The first one is that when you drank your water, you felt it go all the way to your stomach. That is a mindfulness exercise. So it's, it's your brain being conscious of what your body's feeling. And that's where it starts. And then the second thing is you, your body told your brain whether it was hungry or whether it wasn't. That's mindfulness. That's, that's coming into your, and if it wasn't hungry, what else it was? It was angry. It was stressed. It was anxious. It was, and then you can go about correcting whatever, whatever's creating that feeling and, and helping. And then you had a plan. And that is really important. I know you guys have talked about this before, so we won't spend a lot of time there, but you had a plan for if you were hungry and you didn't reach for the first thing, unhealthy thing that wasn't nailed down. So we don't want to, we don't want to even give the impression that we don't want you to eat. That would be silly, but we just want to eat mindfully and deliberately and, um, and actually a couple of these uh, apps that I'm going to show you um, have mindfulness eating, which is great, which actually walks you through the process of tasting your food, <laughs> of chewing it and feeling your feeling it, your body. I know, big, big shock. Before, before surgery, most of us just wolfed it down and that habit can come back. And so once we start tasting it again, uh, it's a wonderful thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. So, so that's where it starts is letting our mind and our body start communicating with each other and doing it. Uh, it, it actually saves so much time through the whole day. If you started out in the morning, because you've, you've set your day, you've, you've given it a good foundation mm -hmm. and you just, you just talk to yourself and you see if there's any stresses that you need to take care of any, any worries that are on your mind or in your body. And you just, you just address them and you create some plan for, for managing them so that you don't need to use food because you don't have the, the problem anymore. And you don't need to activate your dopamine pathways to distract you from 
feeling those feelings because you've acknowledged them, you've got a plan for them. And if you need to resolve old stuff, you can create a, a way to do that, create a plan with someone else or with yourself or, or with a, a friend or family member. So you, you want to acknowledge the feelings and then create a way to, to deal with them, to manage, well, not manage them, to release them, to process them so that they're no longer inside and sometimes this is a many month process and you just so then you'll, you'll say well how am I doing with it today how am I doing with it right now and what do I need to watch for the rest of the day so that's really the basic bottom line is I'm going to connect my mind and my body and it sounds so simple and it's not if you're not used to doing it um, when I look at the AA programs or the, the NA or the OA programs, and then the 12 step programs, basically the first steps are focused on breaking through denial and realizing that you have an addiction or dependence and that it feels pretty powerless. You're, you feel powerless over that and that you believe it, you can't control it. So you may as well just give into it or distract from it. And this, so we want to, we want to get through the denial first and go, yeah, I, I am dependent on sugar or I am dependent on, you know, snacking. And, and once we break through and acknowledge that it makes it so much easier and desirable to connect with ourselves every day. And then the second uh, part of the, the AA program is to work on what actually the causes are. You do the inventories and you do the amends and you do those kinds of things so that they're no longer in your body. The feelings around those are no longer in your body. You've externalized and you've taken them out and you've, you've resolved them or you've tried to resolve them. And then the last part of the program is is just going through and uh, it's sort of a maintenance giving back and serving uh, other people who are going through the program so it it um it crystallizes and reinforces what you've learned. And then you're passing it on to other people, kind of like you and Jason or you, April and Jason are doing. You're on that, the third, third part of that program. So, so that's really basically the overview. And it sounds really easy when we talk about it in those terms, but the hard work is just doing it, first of all, yeah. doing it and not distracting from it. And the second part is, being willing to to just get into the nitty gritty with yourself and getting help if you need it and and then continuing to just keep doing it and realizing that the addiction is the symptom so when you're ready and craving and you want to do something to trigger that dopamine pathway going oh something's wrong inside i need to go inside and figure out what that is yeah i know that uh like what april was saying as far as her taking the water, taking the drink of water and kind of feeling it go and figuring out exactly from that point if she needs to continue. I've taken that just a little bit farther as far as I've set a water goal for myself that's usually about 10 ounces oh, uh, to 12 ounces because I, I, I'm bad at snacking and I'll do it if, it if I can. So I know for myself, I put those those water goals in place and said, you know, you're not getting up to get anything until you put 10 ounces of water down or 12 ounces down depending on how I've, you know, started the day. But usually by that time, I'll either forget or I'll be so full on water, I won't want it anyway. That's so right. I just kind of move on throughout the day. But I mean, there, and there's times that I, you know, that I still know that I do need something. So I'll get up and make it a protein, you know, either a protein bar or something like that, that I've, you know, that I've set aside for myself in a, in a separate cabinet so that I know that I can go to it and not be tempted by other stuff. So, cause, cause I know exactly what I'll do if I, if, if I've got them sitting side by side and it's something I'm not supposed to eat versus something I, I'm supposed to, I'm, 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 I'll be looking at the stuff I'm supposed to, but I'll probably be reaching for the stuff I'm not supposed to. So to, to, to just kind of put myself in a better situation, I've moved all my stuff that I can eat in a different cabinet so that I'm set up for, set up for a little more success versus failure. Yeah. And you got a plan and that's it. Yeah. Well, and I think what, what Jason and I have been saying a lot recently is, you know, what we're talking about is simple. It's, but simple does not equate to easy. Okay. And, and I think the, the, the power of that, while it might seem overwhelming, is that simple and easy in a lot of ways can go hand in hand if we are keeping these things at the forefront of our mind. And it gets exhausting to, to, to think about this and do this work every day. 
But if, if I really reflect on what my life was like before surgery, that was much more exhausting. Mm -hmm. That was killing me. This work is not killing me. This work is making me dig deep and is forcing me to confront some things that maybe I didn't want to confront because I, I was worried they were going to kill me. But the, the, the more that I confront these issues, the more I realize this is not going to kill me. And in fact, this is, this is turning me into a better human. So this work, while heavy and, and not easy, is worth it because my old life was exhausting. It was awful. And my new life is, is filled with so much hope and joy and capacity that could not have existed without doing this work. Right. So the, you know, the scales are always seem to be weighted now in favor of, of doing this work. And it's also helpful to know, I don't know if you've said this or not, but if you, if you are battling addiction or dependency or, or tolerance, there is no shame in that. There is no shame in that. And the fact that we are here talking about it publicly means that we recognize that there is some shame that, that, that society is trying to put on that. And, and we're telling you that you have to own that, that that's not true. And that you can do this work and, and you can become a, a better person. And, and we're here to help you do that work. We're here, we're, we're living proof, we're living examples of the work is not going to kill you. It's not gonna be- It will save our life. It, it will save our life. It will make us strong. And um, not only that, but the same people that would shame us pre-weight pre loss are the same people that will go, how did they do that? They're amazing. They may not tell you that, depends on who they are, but they're the same people going, holy cow, look at that. Yes. And so it, it's just important to, and, and this is where we want to, the, the work gets easier the more you do it. So right. if you if you can do, you know, a, a month of getting up and saying, okay, five to 20 minutes of, of mindfulness and five to 20 minutes before I go to bed, just review my day. The work gets easier after that first month. You almost need to do it or to feel complete. And it lays that foundation for you. Yes. Um, it's, it's sort of how we, it's the story we tell ourselves, which again, different podcast, but, but um, it's how we, how we tell ourselves, how we talk to ourselves about the things that we're doing and taking our reinforcement for ourselves from us, from our mind and body, instead of from out there and trying to impress or be invisible or whatever it is we're doing with out there. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's actually one of the things I was going to say. Like, it's, it's, it's very daunting at first. It's a lot to pile on. And it feels like, you know, that this is your new reality forever. When in reality, it's just going to be like, it's, it's very hard at first to get that thing, you know, to get those things down because we're remapping, we're relearning, we're teaching ourselves to do different things. But like you said, Wendy, eventually it becomes your habit and it becomes what your day is. Mm -hmm. And it, it the, the load gets easier as, you know, it's the same like I've said before, as we lose the weight from our body, the, the rest of these weights get lifted from our shoulders and it can sometimes feel like the same amount of weight that we've lost, you know, up to this point, once we get all that off our shoulders and can really turn it into more of a habit, you know, of a versus just an everyday, you have to consciously think about what's going to be what, it just turns into, you know, your pattern for the day. So, right. yeah, like I say, I mean, it's, it's tough work in the beginning, but it doesn't stay tough forever. That, that's exactly right. And I'll go back to my ice cream analogy. Um, when I, for, for probably the first two years, my husband loves Dev bars and he can eat as many as he wants. It's not going to really make a difference on him, but I would, he would, he would eat them in front of me. And I would think, how, how rude, you know, it's like an alcoholic with, with their spouse drinking in front of them. And I just thought, how, how could he do this? So I finally asked him to take him to a different room, which he did. He was very good. He didn't realize what he was doing to me. And um, at some point in time, that just changed. And, you know, abstinence is not with food is not everybody's answer. It was mine, but it's not something for everybody. But in the beginning, until I had worn new pathways in my brain, it was, I, I looked at him and I would just, you know, osmosis drawing my ice cream. I just, it was, it was awful. I felt like, I felt like an addict going, oh, that just looked like such a good bite. Oh, look at the chocolate on the outside. And just, it was, it was crazy. So, um, it, but after, you know, 15 years out, it's, 
I served ice cream last night as part of dinner and I was one that dipped it and put it in the, you know, anyway, it was easy and it didn't, I didn't even notice it until I'm thinking about it right now. It's, it was just nothing. Um, so I, I would like to share with you, and they're in the notes on the bottom, a couple of, or s several resources. The first one, if you're wondering, do I have an addiction, a tolerance or dependence on food? Uh, Yale has come out with a Yale food addiction scale. And the, the link to that is, is in the notes section of this, of this um, if, on YouTube, on the YouTube channel. And so you can take that and then there's a scoring sheet. And I have to say, it is very difficult to score, uh, but I'll, you know, it's, it's, you've got the directions there. And so you can, you can score it if you want to, but just even reading through the questions and uh, answering yeah. the questions will be helpful to, to go, huh? Okay. I was going to say, yeah, I have read, when you and I first started our work together, you pointed me in that direction and I just read the questions and that was what really solidified my, like, you know, I'd always said it eternally, but after I read that, I was like, oh yeah, no, clue. Oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. I got it. Yes. Um, so, so so great resource. It, it's a, it's a great, it's a great tool. Um, and I, I really, I, I recommend it. Most of my clients take that test. Um, and, and I score it because it's just so miserable. I even find it miserable now after I've done a bunch of them, that's really hard. Uh, so the, that's the first, first set of tools. The second set are the mindfulness <clears throat> tools. And so when we're talking about our head and our body, just connecting with each other, um, there's two apps that are, uh, that are on, um, available for, for the Android and for the Apple phones and they're they're great um i seldom rec recommend apps if you know me well you don't you know that i really I, I like apps but i don't recommend them but these are two that i will recommend um one is and they're again the the links about them are in the notes uh one is called mindfulness coach and it's actually put out by the va and it's got a ton a ton of of meditations or um different different things about different topics that will guide you through the mindfulness process and then the other part i like about it is it's got daily lessons that help you and teach you what mindfulness is and how to be more mindful and when i think of mindfulness i think of meditating for three hours and this is not that this is just it's really short it's easy it's helpful and it's around a variety of topics. Um, it's they've, they've got anxiety, depression, uh, mood mood disturbances, PTSD. They've got one on eating. Um, but remember that most of the, of the reason that we eat isn't because we, you know, because we have an eating issue. I mean, we do, but it's it's because we're anxious or we're depressed or we have some kind of a mood disturbance that holds the eating patterns in place. So I like this one because you can go to those disturbances and you can, you can do a mindfulness activity with it and it will help release the, the emotions around it and it will take away the craving to eat. So, oh, I, I have not downloaded this app yet. This was my homework the last time you and I met professionally and I, I have been a horrible student in this. But are you saying so like, so if I'm in a moment of panic and I, I, I pause and I say, okay, what's really going on? And I say, man, I'm really anxious. I can go to this app and I can say I'm anxious and it's going to, yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. yes. So it's powerful. It's got a ton of stuff. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And it's all free. Well, our tech well, seller probably paid for it, but <laughs> it's, it is free yeah. um, to download now. So, so that I, I recommend that for just general use. And, and again, the lessons are great. They teach you, they help you, they, they help strengthen that mindfulness muscle. The other one that I really like is by someone uh, named Judd Brewer. He is a, a psychiatrist and, psych, and psychologist. Actually, maybe he's a medical doctor. Anyway, he's got a double, he's a psych and an MD. And he, he specializes in neuroscience and he maps the dopamine pathways. He, he does a lot of MRIs or fMRIs on people who are addicted and who, who have compulsions. And so he has really come up with a great program of mindfulness. He's also an Eastern uh, mindfulness meditator, Buddha, Buddhist meditator. And so he's taken those two things and combined them together. And he's written a book called The the craving mind, I think that's what it's called. And I like the book and that's where I learned about the app. And this app is really, really good. And it centers around food. He has one for anxiety as well, but this one is around food and it's called Eat Right Now. 
And it's the first four days are free. They, you don't sign up, you don't give them credit card information. You just, you, you go for the first four days. And that first four days has so many free things that are active forever uh, once, you, once, once they're on there. Um, and then if you choose after the fourth day to go on to the program, then it's uh, $99 for six months and 129 for a year. And then you just keep going. And it's got the lessons the same as the, the Mindfulness Coach. Uh, these are video lessons, Mindfulness Coach are the written paragraphs. Um, but they're, the things that I really like about this particular program, eat, eat right now, a couple of them that make it different from Mindfulness Coach, is it centers on eating, it centers on compulsive eating, it centers on, um, we, he doesn't call it addiction, but it centers on that compulsive eating. And he, he uses mindfulness, getting your, your mind and your body, talking to each other to help you. He's got several different tests or checklists, uh, assessments. So you can go inside and say, okay, am I anxious? Am I depressed? Am I worried? Am I happy? Am I, so you, you're, you're, it's, it's kind of, prompting you to go inside and feel it in the moment what you're doing which is what is is what I'm recommending that we do is find out what we're really up to and then he's got something called the body scan where he walks you through uh, he starts at the tips of your toes and up through your body and it it actually makes your mind aware of what your body's feeling and it lets your body talk to your mind so I like that one. There's several different ones like that that are super helpful. I and mean, then if you like it, then you can purchase day five upwards. Yes. Well, and I think what's so powerful about, you know, all of your recommendations, as Jason and I often say, the, the, goal, in, the goal in our mission at East to West WLS is that we are showing you all of the different recipes for success after bariatric surgery. And if we have ever worked in the kitchen, we know that sometimes we follow a recipe and it doesn't turn out quite right. And we make these little tweaks. We have to look at all of the recipes out there. We need to try them all and we need to figure out what works best for us. And we need to create our own recipe for success. So all that we're doing is saying, hey, look, look at all of these resources that are out here for you. Try them all and, and really you know, engage with them to your best ability. And then Continue to use what resonated with you and worked for you and don't do what is not working and not resonating for you. We all have to make our own recipe. But if you don't even know the different ways to make something, then you're missing out on things that, that could help you. So the fact that there are these wonderful resources, the Yale study, uh, Mindfulness Coach and Eat Right Now apps, and then that book, right, The, the Craving Mind, are all wonderful places that, that we can start and, and try and just see see what sticks and what doesn't. I mean, exactly. Right. And for me, it's different things at different times. Yeah, yes, yeah. Well, one of the biggest things that you talked about that, that I think is gonna be most powerful for people is that like you had said, abstinence works for you for ice cream, but it may not work for everybody else. There are people Absolutely. out there that, that need that rigidity of the structure of the program to stay on path so that they don't ever veer off so that they're just dialed into where their goals are and that's how they get to the finish line. But there's other people who are going to have to, you know, veer a little bit off maybe what the, the desired path would be, you know, dabble a little bit, you know, maybe have a, a few a small amount of a few things they may you know may not be as perfect for their program to be able to overall you know meet the same goal that they want to get to and I think that's the beauty of how everyone's journey being this so different but also being the same that's it's that that old adage that you know everybody can get to the destination but how you get there the, the journey is going to be different for everybody but as long as we meet at the end, that you know, that's the goal. That's really well said, Jason. And and I think that for for me, as I work with people and as I live the journey myself, the the biggest the biggest um, uniter, the biggest component is really knowing what's going on inside. That how however you get there is going to get you there. If you if you don't know what's going on here there's going to be a lot of veering going on and, and the destination may not be where you want it to really be. So yeah, but everybody's going to have their way. And my way 15 years out is way different than my way was two years out mm -hmm. or six months out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Con so constant great. reflection is key, right? Just, just constantly being aware. Yeah. We, we recently rolled out some trackers that we are super proud and excited about. It's basically eight things that we need to do every day, to, you know, to find success in, in weight loss surgery. Yeah. And I really think the key to Jason and I's success is that we might, we are not perfect every day but we shoot for consistency. And if we can do the things that we know we need to do to find success after bariatric surgery, we, we will be successful. And again, right, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but it can be simple. And, and if we can keep it simple, if we can keep it at the forefront of our mind, despite everything else that's going on, we, you know, Jason is a grandfather, a professional. I'm, I'm a professional. Wendy, you're a professional, you, you know, kids, grandkids, the life is crazy. But if we put ourselves on the back burner, then we're just going back to, to what we did before surgery. And we didn't go through all this to go back to our old ways. Exactly if right. If we can find simple ways to engage in our recovery, to engage in our process every single day, we can utilize the tools that so many people and organizations have made available to us, we will find success. And uh, then, yeah, then, we're the, you know, and the goal I think for everybody is, you want to give back. You get to this point and you're like, oh my gosh, I feel so amazing. My life is so wonderful. I want everybody to, to feel this way. So if more people can get to where we are, I mean, imagine the, the community support that, that, that will exist. Well, it flood the earth with support. Right. Um, and these, these eight trackers, that's a great um, mindfulness tool. It's, yes. a, it's a great way to be mindful about what you're up to and doing it, doing it deliberately. I like the word deliberate a lot because um, mindful is kind of a woo-woo word for some people. So I, I, it's just doing it deliberately. Um, yeah, now this is, this is all great, but just you know, figuring it out that way. But, and staying well, in touch with yourself, putting, putting as much, well, probably not as much effort, but putting a lot of effort into post-surgery. We all know pre-surgery, we, we did a lot of things. We jumped through a lot of hoops. We, we were looking at diets. We had to do the pre-surgical diet, most of us did. And we spent a lot of time thinking about, about ourselves and how, and, and not doing things uh, mindlessly. And so at least putting 75% of the same effort in post-surgery. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's one of the things like when April's talking about the tracking and stuff, you know, when you and I met and did the podcast on or the live about tracking and doing all that, and I, I openly admitted I knew I wasn't doing a lot of the stuff I should have been doing to get me where I wanted to be. And it's funny that I started, I started enacting in my daily life, the stuff April and I had been talking about, and I made the necessary adjustments I knew I needed to make. And what I thought was a stall, which could have started out as a stall, but probably wouldn't have been near as long of a stall. I've dropped 13 pounds in less than a month, just making the changes that I made specifically because I knew that I had not only just kind of veered off course a little bit, I was letting stuff into my daily routine that I know damn good and well wasn't going to serve me in my end all goal. And so making those adjustments and clearing all the other stuff out and really focusing on making sure I get enough water in led me to making better decisions throughout the day. And yeah, in, in just in that small amount of time, I've lost, you know, 13 pounds. So Fantastic. It, it, it can, it can work. If you, if you do the work, it will work for you. Yeah. Absolutely. So I know this was a, a heavy, heavy episode, but I feel like there's so much needed information that, that was shared. I, every, I say this every time, but every time I come away from these conversations, I'm just so much more grounded in, in the work that we have to do. I'm so much more, you know, clear on, on the vision and, you know, and, and the whole purpose of this. So Wendy, we just, we cannot thank you enough for giving us your, your time and your invaluable insights and your professionalism. I mean, it's just, it, it's unbelievable that, that you are a resource uh, for this community. It's just, uh, thank such you. Such a pleasure. I, I love this community. You guys are my people. And uh, I love the community. I love being able to share. It, it, it cements my own resolve every time. So thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. And I enjoy it a lot. Yeah. Well, uh, for, for all of you listeners and for all of you watchers, uh, Wendy is uh, a very active participant in this community. She's joined us on previous episodes. She will join us on 
<laughs> on episodes in the future as well, because we're, we're, we are so thankful for her resource. And all of the apps and the books and the recommendations that the Yale test that she um, talked about today are gonna be available in the show notes. They're gonna be available linked on our Instagram page. So if you are not on Instagram, I definitely recommend that you follow us over there. We're just at East, the number two West underscore WLS. There's a link in our, in our bio. If you click there, it's gonna take you to all of these resources. So it'll be easily accessible. We're gonna make them available on our website as well. Uh, www.east2westwls.com. We just wanna make sure that this information gets, get, gets out to everybody. So no matter what your learning modality is, whether you like to, to watch, to listen, to read, to, to take in, we're, we're, we're working very hard to make sure that we can provide you resources in a way that you like to learn. So uh, if, you, if you're having trouble locating something, please you know, send us an email, uh, find us on Instagram, uh, and, and we would absolutely like, like to connect you. Um, Wendy, any, anything that, that we missed, anything that you want to tell our listeners or watchers? Just hang in there, you know, be happy, hang in there. That's pretty dang good advice. <laughs> um, if you like what you are listening or, or hearing or interacting with, please let us know. We love your feedback. Uh, we would love uh, for you to, to rate us and leave us a review on your podcast app. We would love for you to share what we do on, on your, in your communities, with your friends and family, on your feed. Uh, the more that we grow, the more support that we can continue to offer this community. So your feedback and your support is absolutely invaluable. We would, we would very much appreciate that. But I think that's it. I think we did it, friends. I do. We did it. Pretty amazing. All right. Well, as always, thank you so very much for, for the conversation today, Wendy. We, 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 are, we are ready to dive in to, to these issues ourselves, and, and we, we know that, that this community is as well. So we're, we're ready to do the work. Best wishes, everybody. Thank you. Jason, you want to take us out? Yes, ma'am. Wendy, we can't, like, like April said, we can't thank you enough. We appreciate you being here every single time and being a resource for us, even when you're not on the podcast, your, your knowledge and your help and your just warmth is, is just like April said, invaluable. We appreciate it so much. And uh, to everybody listening, watching, uh, really appreciate all the support that you've given us up to this point. We couldn't be doing what we're doing without you guys helping us to get where we are today. Uh, we're going to continue on the journey. So we just appreciate everybody that will be along for the ride for that as well. And uh, until next time, just remember, uh, you've got this and we've got you. Always. All right, friends. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.